You are listening to Rechurched, a podcast aimed at instigating Christians to be Christian. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name's Ethan, and you're listening to the Rechurched podcast. I'm, I'm joined by my co-host, Matt. What's up? Here we are again, back at it. So we are... I forget what episode number this is, but I think it's episode 10. Episode 10. Wow. So for episode 10, we're talking about the pure gospel. But but before we get there, I want to do a little icebreaker. Oh, boy. But before we get there, I want to just say, if you're listening to this episode, my suggestion would be to first go back to the beginning of this season and listen through every single episode until this one. Once you do that, then listen to this and continue on. But I think that's how this season really has worked well is listening to them sequentially because they build on each other. This episode's not really like, it doesn't build on the false gospels. It contrasts with them. But I think the way we flowed this season, it just helps to, I guess, start from where we started. Put on some AirPods, go for a walk and get rechurched. Start with the welcome episode. I think that sets the table and obviously work your way through the false gospels. And I think you'll see they're nuanced out enough where they're separate. You can learn about different narratives, ideologies, and messages that are contrary or antithetical to the Bible and the true gospel, while at the same time being equipped and challenged and charged to be unashamed of the pure gospel, which is what we're going to define in today's episode. Right. So before we get into the episode, let's start with a little icebreaker to shake things up. Have you ever completed anything on your bucket list or have you had a bucket list? I do not have a bucket list, but if I was to have a bucket list, it would be to marry Sarah Peterson, which I've accomplished. And now I can die a happy man. (laughs) There we go. That's pretty great. Thank you. (laughs) Um, So mine, I mean, do you have a bucket list? uh, I sort of, I kind of had one, I guess a few years back, but one of them was to go to like a lantern festival, which is like, it's these like Chinese looking lanterns and you like light, you light them and then you just kind of like hold them there for the heat to gather and then you let it go. And usually there's thousands of people. So this past fall in 2021, uh, my fiance Sage and I, actually went to one of them in Pennsylvania Hmm. and there were probably, I don't know, maybe 60,000 people, um, with us. Yeah. Um, it was absolutely nuts, but when the sun goes down, you all light them and let them go. And it was like nothing I've ever experienced before just to see like, I don't know, just I don't want to be corny, but it was, it was magical. It was pretty, pretty awesome. Um, so we got obviously a bunch of, you know, pictures and Instagram stuff for, for that. But, uh, that was definitely crossed off my bucket list for, you know what? Years ago I met, um, a young gal named Rapunzel. She had really long hair and for some reason she just wanted to see lanterns being floated into the sky and I made that happen. So, wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Come to find out, she was the princess that was missing. Wow. And I know that, ladies and gentlemen, because my daughter is almost three and she loves Tangled. So I do know what it looks like for a lantern festival, as you say. (laughs) It's a great movie, actually. I'm I'm all about it. (laughs) Awesome. Well, uh, that that was great. I love that. Let's get into uh, today's episode, which is um, the pure gospel. Um, So we've made our way through a bunch of false gospels. Can you rattle them off? Yes, I can. Go for it. First, you have the prosperity gospel. Um, I can't give all the sticky definitions. I'll give the sticky. You give. All right, so go ahead. All right, so first, prosperity gospel. All right, that is a message that tells you you always should be happy, healthy, and wealthy, and never mentioning the fact that you are required to be holy. So it's a promise that God wants to bless you, and he does, but it's materially based, and it's built upon the idea that prosperity defines our faith, and that's not true. So it's a false gospel. 
So that's number one. Number two is the psychology gospel. That was a fun one. That dealt with me or you always being the victor or the hero of every story. And while at the same time, we should certainly find practical application to biblical accounts, we're not to be David all the time, right? And uh, the sticky statement that always comes to mind is David standing before Goliath with a stone. Of course, I want to be in that position. We're never David standing before Nathan in our sin. So the psychology gospel basically bolsters or boosts your your self-esteem when the Bible really tells you about denying self. So we had a secondary episode, if you recall, yeah. Dr. Carl Benzio was with us and helped us really show where the gospel should infuse psychology or suke, the psyche, which is the study of the soul. So it's important, Definitely. but we are not to be the chief aim of the gospel message. Christ is. It's yeah. about Christ glorified. Amen. So number three is the progressive gospel, which was a three-parter. Yep. Um, that was probably my favorite to talk about, yeah. I think, because it's the most uh, relevant, I think, and sure. really like hard to navigate sometimes. But um, I I'm, I'm, might be a little biased, but I think we did a good job. So I hope so. We did several parts, which included obviously dealing with some current events and some really hot topics. And the reason we did that is because a spirit of liberalism has entered into the Church of Jesus Christ which takes certain scriptures and really stretches them beyond their intention. So progressivism can be defined by bending to sinful man while offending a holy God, right? It's the message of affirmation on certain lifestyles. There's no call to repentance or accountability. It's the idea behind social justice and everything's racist and wokeism, which ultimately is a hateful religion that deals with canceling people's livelihoods, dealt with abortion, the two um, political stances that people take, pro-life versus pro-choice, and we teased out the fact that they're not political stances, yeah. right? God is pro-life yeah. through and through, from the womb to the tomb. Yep. So that's non-debatable, yep. right? We talked about human rights are usually wrong when they contradict what God says is right for humans. Huge difference, right? God defines what's right. God defines the biological order, male and female. God defines the family. Because he created every single one of those. He's in charge of all of it. So we have to look to him. And the progressive gospel ultimately goes way beyond the boundaries of the Bible. And when you do that, you end up in bondage to Babel. So then we made our way to our fourth and final false gospel, which was the political gospel. And that was a two-parter. Yes, and yeah, give us a stick it up. I just found the political gospel ultimately can be divided into two parts, probably more, but in my mind, it makes sense that one side of the political gospel is the state becomes God, right? So that could be a politician or a president or somebody in that realm we worship as the Messiah. And that's wrong. State is never God. And ultimately, God uses men and women. I often say he uses unrighteous rulers even to accomplish his righteous rule. You look in the Bible, he used Nebuchadnezzar. He used Cyrus. He used, he used all types of rules. It's Pilate to accomplish his righteous rule. So regardless of what I think about a certain leader, God will use them. However, I want to make sure my decisions, my voting, my life is in alignment with the Bible. The other side of the political gospel is Christians who are content with a godless state, hmm. right? Well, we're not supposed to engage with the culture or separation of church and state, separation right? of church and state, which is a lie that has caused so much damage. Because when you look at the inception of America from the inaugural address from George Washington to the framing and founding of our governmental documents, they're explicit with Bible, biblical language. So yes, this was not a Christian nation. I have, the, I have what are my quote fingers up, but this was a nation of Christians and a nations of Christians set the tone and that's why there are churches on every corner for decades yep. hundreds of years and that is why the ten commandments are the let's say uh i think it's jurisprudence hmm. which means right the law of the land hmm. right really internationally the ten commandments have become the common code of man in the known world. And where does that come from? Well, it comes from a place where God establishes order for mankind. So it's a lie to say we should separate the two. 
So that, that was really good. So we have the prosperity gospel, the psychology gospel, the progressive gospel, and the political gospel. And now in stark contrast to all the other episodes we've re- released so far, we have the pure gospel. And why is that? Well, because all the other episodes, we've been focusing on the wrongness of these counterfeit or false gospels. But in this episode, we're going to be looking at the rightness of the true or pure gospel and what that is, what it looks like, why it is the pure gospel. Um, And really, our hope is that knowing and clinging to a true understanding of what the unadulterated gospel is will help guard your soul against any other false gospel that might try to put proclaim that it's the truth when it's not. So I'm sure Matt has a lot of thoughts on the pure gospel. Um, I know he always does, but I wanted to share some of my own real quick before we dive fully into it. Um, This whole podcast is about being, you know, rechurched. So refining and refocusing Our worldview to be based on biblical truth is basically what we're trying to do. Um, And I really want to stress this up front is that the gospel is not just for non-believers. The gospel is for everyone, believer and non-believer. Why is that? Because the gospel is the foundation of our faith. If you're a believer, the gospel is the foundation of what you believe. That's why it's still important. So if you are listening to this and you got the urge to jump off the episode because it doesn't apply to you because you already know, because you already believe in Jesus. Stay. I promise you it'll be a great reminder for the beauty of why we believe what we believe. Um, and it's a, it's a great reminder as a believer to know what you believe and to be refreshed in that and to be refined in that. And then for a non-believer, if you're listening, this is hopefully a chance for you to hear what we believe and why we believe it. So what we have went over in past episodes is that The gospel is not about you. It's not about me. It's not about any of that. It's about Jesus. And we're going to go back to the basics with this one. So Matt, to kind of like we've approached every other episode this far, we've really attacked it from like a high level. So I want to do that in this episode as well. What is this gospel? And what is it about in contrast to the other false gospels? Right. So first and foremost, let's define the word gospel it means good news we know that in the greek it's euangelion it can also be defined as one who heralds or proclaims and that is why we say the gospel i'm proclaiming the good news that god became man that's jesus that man became a lamb and laid down his life as a sacrifice for my life so christ took by way of the cross, the death that I deserved. Mm -hmm. That's good news. Why is that good news? Well, because the bad news is the wages of sin is death. And everyone who has ever been given breath as a human being is a sinner. And based on that status is deserving of death. And not just death and extinguishment, like you no longer exist after you die. No, there's an eternity that you remain in that state. That's hell, separation from God. So good news is that Christ made a way for you to be saved. It's where we get the word salvation. So any Christian should be one who heralds the good news, right? Now, before we go all the way back to the origin of the bad news, I think it's appropriate to share an illustration because in the days of Jesus, in the days of antiquity, really, mind you, they didn't have the luxuries we have today, Ethan, with showers, scented deodorants, scented soaps. Think about that for a second, right? How did they have running water? They figured it out, but they didn't have the luxuries that we have to take care of our hygiene. So when a soap wearer or somebody that was selling soap would come into the town and he would announce his presence, he would start by saying, good news, like announcing that he had a product that he wanted to sell them. And it was soap, literally 
soap to keep them clean, to wash wow. their dirty, dirty parts. <laughs> well, that's good news in a land and a culture where you smell. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? <laughs> And obviously the rich and the noble had the money to be able to purchase such accommodations mm. and luxuries. But just think about that now, right? People were, were excited to receive this good news message of a soap wearer. And that is exactly what it means to be one who heralds the message of the good news, that Christ came to cleanse us from our sins. Yeah. That's good news. Yeah. When you, in and of yourself, your nature stinks, rotten to the core. And a lot of people don't want to admit that, right? Because we have this sense of, you know what? I'm not as bad as the next person. And I'm a good person. And that's usually what you hear, sadly, at funerals, right? Mm -hmm. People that really don't know Christ, you usually hear when the open mic opportunity happens. What do people say? He was a good guy. He was a good guy. Johnny was a good guy. Johnny. Right, and they eulogize Johnny. Forgive me if your loved one who passed away is named Johnny. Actually, my brother who passed away is named John. So nobody oh, yeah. write me a hateful email. Not yeah, being insensitive, yeah. I'm simply just saying we have this idea that because someone is good, where is the standard that we're measuring their goodness to? Which is a question that they're going to make their way to heaven, and that's not true. And I think Christians have to have the love enough to tell you that mm. the origin of the gospel actually came out of Jesus's mouth. Did you know that? I can't say it was the first recorded words of Jesus, but maybe it was where he started his ministry. We know that he was baptized by John the Baptist. It's when the audible voice of the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit falls upon Christ and he's driven into the wilderness by the spirit. It says, interestingly, the spirit is the power that drove him where to a place where he'd be tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights while he's fasting. And he is literally emptying himself of his flesh for his mission ahead. His ministry was about to start. The, the devil comes tempting at his lowest point. Mm. Jesus Christ is tempted. And what does he utilize to combat the temptations of the devil? The word of God, the word of God. You can say he had a biblical worldview, <laughs> And these temptations came at him, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And you can read about them in Matthew 4. And he overcomes the temptation of the devil, which is really encouraging because it tells us in Hebrews, Jesus was made of the same stuff as us, right? He is a high priest who can empathize with us in our mm. weaknesses. Yet, mm. tempted in all points, he sinned not. Mm. So he's the perfect sin substitute for my sinfulness. Okay, right after that, it says he enters into... A certain region. It's Mark chapter one. The ministry of John the Baptist was seemingly ceased as the forerunner of Christ. He basically heralded the fact that somebody's going to come after me that I'm going to be pointing to. Well, Jesus shows up. John is put in prison. Jesus comes to Galilee preaching. Here's the first time it's mentioned. You ready? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus is preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. What did he say? Verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Here's the message. You ready? Repent and believe in the gospel. Hmm. Isn't that pretty cool? Yeah, it is really cool. Out, of the, you, more, out of the mouth of Jesus, the, he, he's, he's giving you the exact this is it. formula of the gospel. This is exactly what... It's not all the smoke and mirrors. It's this. Well, it's not just about the healing. The healings were a byproduct right, of yeah. his existence, yeah. of God being on earth. Yeah. There was going to be healings. Eyes were going to be opened. Ears were going to be unclogged. Tongues were going to be set loose. All of those were byproducts, but that wasn't why he came. He came to herald in the good news of his life in exchange for our dead lives. Hmm. Notice it says the time is fulfilled. Chronologically speaking... Time, in that moment, found a fulfillment in the creator of time itself. Mm. Jesus, who is God, sits outside of time as God, decides to enter into time at a certain time to redeem mankind for all time. That's gangster. <laughs> that is gangster. But not just chronologically. The time is fulfilled prophetically. This mm. moment all of the Old mm. Testament prophecies about this Messiah, this Christ, namely Jesus, that's his earthly name, means Lord, the Lord who saves. 
finds its fulfillment. Like in this moment, Everything about the Bible in the Old Testament, over 300 prophecies about the first coming of Christ, literally fulfilled in one statement. The time is fulfilled. Like, I am fulfilling all of time. And then he tells us why he's here. Repent. Hmm. Which means change your mind. It's a Greek word, metanoia. Meta change, noia mind. It means change your mind because sin has damaged your mind. Sin has separated you from God. And Jesus came to redeem us from that broken state where relations with God were severed because of sin, redeeming us and placing us back in right standing with God. So Ethan, this is the last thing I'm going to say, then you can take over and we'll go back and forth. You said earlier about the gospel message. And in my mind, I literally went to the reason why all this matters. The reason why we took time defining the false gospel and its derivatives, namely the alliterations of the P's, is because all of those false gospels lend themselves to a lifestyle. You live a certain way. Why? Because behavior is determined by belief. Right. What you believe determines how you behave. So there's the truth of the gospel, which is this episode, the truth of the pure gospel. But there's also gospel truths, right? So it's not just the message. It's also what the message does as an influence on the way I live. Gospel truths, well, let me back up. The truth of the gospel is that God makes me righteous even though I'm unrighteous. And then gospel truths are how that righteousness makes me. And I live a lifestyle of righteousness as I live in right standing with Christ. And that is why all of those previously defined narratives which affect how I live, how I see life, need to be called out so that I can live a life of righteous Mm. living, which ultimately is birthed out of the pure gospel. I think it's um, interesting that what Jesus says, he says, repent and believe the good news. He says, repent, turn away from. That's right. But he doesn't leave it at that. He's not like, repent. All right, that's it. Right. And believe the good news. Yes. So. That's good. So the good news there has to be some sort of interaction with it. You have to believe it. So what, what's another word that could be like interchanged with believe? Like, I, I think I've always heard it as like belief is like trust, like sort of like a trust. Like you're sure. not just, you're not just like, oh yeah, I believe in God. It's like, no, if you, if you believe in God, like that, that goes past your like knowledge. It's like, it's more than that. That's right. It's an interaction and it's, engagement. It's what you and I did when we sat down in our studio here, right? Mm. We both trusted that our weight would be held up by the seats that we're sitting in. Mm. We trusted without thinking. It had nothing to do with knowledge, Ethan. When I sat down, I put all of my weight on the seat. So to believe the gospel is to literally receive Mm. the truth that God can hold you. Mm. All of you, your weight, your life, your decisions, your occupation, your children, your marriage, your future— he can hold it all. Do you believe that? That's the gospel. Like mm. God loved me that much that he gave me Jesus, but he didn't just give me Jesus and leave me an orphan. He made me a son of the kingdom. So I often go in my mind, again, this is, a, this is the teacher in me. What did he do? He gave me forgiveness. I needed that because I'm a sinner. But he didn't just leave me in that spot. He then gave me his righteousness. So now I'm the recipient of forgiveness. And then he calls me back to himself and says, no, 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 no. Don't walk away just forgiven. Here's my own righteousness. And he slaps on me the righteousness that Mm. I don't have, nor do I deserve. And then I walk away and that's good enough for me. And he goes, no, 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 come back. Here's forgiveness. Here's righteousness. And you're going to need this to navigate your world. And he gives me his very own presence Mm. and he deposits his Holy Spirit within us. And that's what it means to be a Christian. Forgiveness, righteousness, presence. And guess what is a natural result of having the presence of God live inside of you. Forgiveness, righteousness, presence, resemblance. You begin Mm. to look like Christ. So we're the replication of Christ on earth. Mm. That's why Paul was like, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In other words, the world needs to see little Jesuses, that's us, the body, and they need to know they can be forgiven too. And they need to know they can have the righteousness of God in Christ as well. And they need to know that the presence of God wants to live inside of them. But they first need to know that they are desperately lost without 
the message of the gospel. Yeah, I, I, I don't know where I've heard this from. Um, it's probably a really uh, uh, elementary sort of analogy, I guess. But like Jesus is known as the light of the world, like the light. So if we're to reflect Christ, like I always think of like um, looking like Christ as almost like being like a not a puppet, but like you're trying or a, a mime or mime. No. Yeah, mime. Yeah, I guess a mime. You're trying to like act like. But then I think recently I've been just like kind of trying to think about a different way of looking at it. And this is, I think, ele- more elementary, but um, a mirror, you know, if wh- what does a mirror reflect? It reflects light. So if Jesus is the light of the world, we're meant to be wherever we're placed and, and pointing. That's where the light of Christ should be should be hitting, right. you know. Um, so I don't know. I was just thinking about that. But <laughs> that's truth. I think that it's it's it is basic and it's simple, but gosh, it begs the question for all of us to go: Am I actually reflecting the light of Christ in my life? Yeah, because because if if you are reflecting the light of Christ, you should be seeing just like if you were to flash a flashlight or a laser in a mirror, you will see where that laser, where that light is hitting on the other side. So if you don't see that in your life, if you claim the name of of Christ in your life and you think that you're reflecting the light of Christ, but it's not affecting anything that you're doing. That should be a tell right there. Right. That maybe you're not reflecting as much light as you thought. Your, I don't know. your mirror has been blacked out. Yeah. Or tinted. Remember Francis D. Assisi said, preach the gospel and when necessary, use words I say often, you may be the only Bible somebody reads, not to be separated from preaching and teaching and speaking the gospel, but certainly it becomes a gateway. I know that from my own testimony, Ethan, there were guys in prison, they didn't want nothing to do with God, religion, the Bible, let alone the definition of the gospel, the Mm. good news. They had no clue what any of that meant. Remember, the sinner's heart rejects, or let's say the sinner's heart's dark. And what's the first thing that you do not want flooded upon your bedroom in the morning when you just wake up? Light. Light. <laughs> that was not a trick question. <laughs> I was like thinking way but too light. Deep. Like you don't want somebody to just come in and turn the light on. Yeah, and that's no. what we think we should do with non-believers. Like right. turn the light on and blah. <laughs> no, it, it scares them. You have to ease your way in so that their eyes can finally adjust to the light. And in prison, it was my actions, brother. It was my conduct mm. as a reflection of Christ. Loving the unlovable, trying to reach the unreachable, trying to teach the unteachable. That's cool. All of that was birthed out of my conduct. And when they realized, and Theodore Roosevelt says said this, um, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. It's true. And when my peers began to notice that there was something unique about the way I was living, that's when they asked the question. That's when they were curious. That's when they were thirsty for it. And that is when I was able to verbalize the gospel, right? Mm-hmm. So yes, you can verbalize it and preach it. And the, the God that we serve can turn any heart to himself. But I, I'm convinced when we live it, people see it and they'll be curious about it. They'll wonder where you get your peace from in a, an unpeaceful world. And I think those are the questions that give us the opportunity to say, oh, my the peace? Oh, it's not my peace. And then I can insert gospel. Absolutely. So how do we know that what we're calling the pure gospel is the actual pure gospel? Right. Bible. God know the Bible. God speaks Bible. So God defines the gospel for us out of Jesus' own mouth and ministry. Jesus is the fulfillment of the gospel, the good news that God sent himself to redeem sinful man. The reason that's important is because way back in Genesis is where we get the fall of humanity. It came through our forefather Adam and Eve and through their act of disobedience mainly Adam's disobedience it says in the scriptures Eve was deceived by the serpent that's Satan to defy God thrusting themselves and mankind into a state of sin remember they were in a perfect state in the garden of Eden Mm. they were in paradise we call it 
Paradise was lost. And it tells us when they realized they had sinned against God, Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, one verse, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Okay, so prior to this, the knowledge that they were naked, as far as shame goes, was not present. Mm. So they were naked and it was pure. They had pure eyes. I mean, I digress when I think about why we wear clothes. Right. Isn't that funny? (laughs) Everyone everywhere, except for maybe like third world countries and tribes where people walk around naked or nude beaches somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Clothing expresses the bad news that we're sinners and we can't save ourselves. Mm. Did you know that? Did you ever think about that? Like the fact that I put clothes on today. Thank you, by the way, for wearing clothes while we're doing this podcast, Ethan. (laughs) Is expressly saying, I need to cover my shame. And this is what Adam and Eve realized in that moment. They're naked. What do they do? It tells us. Let they me continue. So uh, what? Fig leaves together? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And man has been attempting to cover himself ever since. Hmm. Whatever man can make as a form of covering, religion, false religion, false gospels, false messages. Every world religion is built on self-covering. Hmm. Your good works are good enough. Self-covering. Say this prayer. And you'll be good with God, self-covering. Mm. Prescribed to this tradition, self-covering. I was raised in a Catholic family, a Christian family, Buddhist family, Muslim family, self-covering. All of these messages from the world are forms of covering my own shame. And that's why later on in the account, after God defines the curse, hey, this is what the consequences are of your sinful actions, Adam, Eve, and serpent. But then there's a promise in the midst of of the curses that there would be a blessing and it would be the seed of Eve, Genesis 3.15, and a seed would come and redeem it. They had no idea what that meant at the time, but it's a prophecy and it's the beginning stages of the good news of the gospel. And yet Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, God, it tells us, ready? And also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. A lot of Bible scholars might differ here Majority and conservative scholars say that verse, the covering that God replaces from their fig leaves to, it says, tunics of skin, is probably the first animal sacrifice in the Bible. Mm. So God himself likely killed a lamb as a sacrifice, so blood was shed, as a way to make them tunics of clothing to cover them. So it was God like, no, you don't cover you, I cover you. And it's the first prefiguring of the cross of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that would eventually shed his blood and cover us. That's interesting. That's the gospel. Uh. So from there, all the way through the scriptures, what do you see? Man's attempt to fix it themselves. Man's cover, wicked state. Man's, man's attempt, wicked state, yeah. just Cain kills Abel within yeah. chapter four of the creation story. Cain kills Abel. And off to the races we go. God's chosen people through Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob, namely Israel, the 12 tribes, off to the races they go. Sinful state, rebelling against God. God chases them down. God does the work. God calls them back to himself. Repent. Turn around. Come back and believe. (laughs) I got your best interest. I am your creator. I love you. All the way through the scriptures, the prophets, the Psalms, the minor prophets, eventually we're introduced to the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where we get we get the person of Jesus and he is the fulfillment mm. the time is fulfilled the kingdom of god is at hand mm. repent and believe the euangelion the good news you have a great sermon jam that we put together um a couple years back that is sort of sort of what you were talking about starts with genesis 3 right old test the old testament sermon jam right remember that people like that yeah and it uh we'll put it in the show notes um definitely give it a watch it's a really cool way to uh get hyped up on that mayor but also the word of god and see the seed of eve at play from genesis 3 that's right all the way until the gospels right yes yeah, every the book way. of the old testament yeah That shows you where Christ shows up. So when people think that Jesus was reduced to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's so much bigger than that. Mm. Remember, Jesus is not just the, no, (laughs) nay, Jesus is not the founder of a religion. Mm. Jesus is the founder of the world. 
Yeah. That's a huge <laughs> difference between the two. He's the founder of the world, then he's the author and finisher of our faith. That's right. So he cre- he created That's right. and he finishes the faith. That's right. This whole thing rises and falls on him. Yeah. Him alone. And yep. that's why we got to get the pure gospel right. Not only in what we preach, teach, but expressively in what we live. Hmm. Ethan, if this is true, that Christ took death from me, then what am I fearing in this life if death is supposed to be the greatest fear? So, yeah. there's yeah, no, Nothing. I shouldn't fear anything. Yeah. I shouldn't fear coronavirus. <laughs> coronavirus should not have shut down churches. Yeah, I know. Coronavirus should not have shuttered in Christians who said, I believe God is good and he's faithful and he's a creator. And yet, I don't think God is the one that controls my death. He gave me life, but he doesn't have a say on my death. And I'm going, that's wrong thinking. Hmm. That's not biblical thinking. In fact, I'm not encouraging anybody to be reckless. I'm just encouraging Christians to be faithful. That's what it means to be rechurched. So I live in light of the fact that God controls my birth. God controls my death. And I have to be equipped to share. If somebody was to ask you, hey, what's the good news? What do you believe? The challenge is, can you, in X amount of words or less, really, I don't want to put an amount of numbers on that. Can you express or share your faith and explain the pure gospel? That should be the Mm. challenge of each of us. So I think it's worthwhile with all the content and all the conversation thus far to pause and pivot. And I'm going to walk us through what is called, it's known as the Romans Road. And the reason it's called Romans Road, because these verses are found in the book of Romans. But I don't want to Christianize it and commercialize it and desensitize it as much as I want you to hear the buildup. Right Where we begin with the pure gospel, Romans 3.10. Again, you don't have to use these verses, but just in your mind, this is how it should frame. There's none righteous, no, not one. That's Romans 3.10. That's the first place. There's no one that's righteous, which means none of our good works, our good deeds are righteous in God's sight. So we don't have any hope in and of ourselves. I then make my way a few verses ahead in Romans 3.23. And it simply says, all have sinned, all being every last one of us, and we all fall short of the glory of God. So there's the bar for humanity. Sinners who are lost without a Savior. We eventually make our way to Romans chapter 5. And I like to quote Romans 5, 8. And it says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we're sinners, remember, we're still sinners, Christ died for us. My testimony, I love sharing it on January 7th where I stood before a judge because I was deserving of the consequences of the crime I committed. You guys know my testimony out there. If you don't and you're joining us for the first time, I'm going to give it to you in a very quick fashion for time's sake. But I stood in the rightful place of judgment. I was going to receive the consequences for my decision. And that's when my victim's son stood up. A son stood up, entered in, interrupted, and gave me what I did not deserve. And I literally was set free by a hug that he gave me, Ethan. I was set free to spend the next 55 months in prison, locked up physically, yet free spiritually Mm. and emotionally. Mm. And when I think about that picture, that pales, as real as that was, as powerful as that was, that pales in comparison to what Christ did. A son stood up, entered in, interrupted, intercepted the very judgment I do deserve, Mm. the death that awaits me. And he gave me forgiveness and he gave me righteousness and he gave me his presence. That sets us free beyond any human forgiveness or human liberty. So where do we go from here? We go to Romans 6, 23, the next stop. It says this, for the wages of sin is death, obviously, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now we're making our way. We're recognizing there's a gift that has nothing to do with us. And it's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Eventually, you come to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And you need to be reminded at this point that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, there is no condemnation. And I obviously have to remind myself there's no condemnation. And a lot of people jump over to Romans 10. And they basically end with with verses 8 to 10. But I'm just going to read verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth, this is the pure gospel, the Lord Jesus... 
and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. When it says raised from the dead, it speaks of the resurrection, right? So Christ hung on a cross. That's the crucifixion. And three days later, he rose from the grave. That's the resurrection. Basically, the resurrection validates everything that he said and did in his earthly life and ministry. It validates that he was and he is who he said he was and who he said he is. He was God Hmm. incarnate. He was God made flesh. So our entire faith rests on, one, those verses I just talked us and walked us through. Well, at the same time, the resurrection of Christ, that the tomb is empty, sets this message apart from every other religious message in all of the world. Every other religious leader is dead and in their grave. Christ alone stands as the only one who conquered death, and that's the pure gospel. So anyone from anywhere who's done anything can receive this good news, the gospel, to be saved from their sin receive the one and only son john 3 16 god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son the only begotten that whoever believes there's that word again trust in him shall not what perish but have everlasting life that's the gospel that is what it literally means to be rechurched coming back to your first love So we just got done talking about what the gospel is, and you did a really, really good job of going through that and exploring that. Um, I I figured, why not go through what believing the gospel actually gets you as far as benefits go? That sounds super weird when I say it out loud of like, it just doesn't seem so selfish, you know, because I have done nothing. We have done nothing to deserve the grace and glory and uh, every benefit that the Lord gives us. Um, And our heart toward the gospel should not be to get these benefits. Our heart toward the gospel is a realization like we, we saw that Jesus said some of his first words in his ministry, repent and believe in the good news. And so once that's done though, there are some benefits of believing in the good news, in trusting in Jesus, in walking in righteousness, like we talked about. And I have been personally going through Romans 8 um, in my personal devotions quite a bit, and I've been loving it. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I encourage you to go through and read Romans 8. I found myself <laughs> reading it in in chunks, in little chunks, because, man, if you really want to wrap your heart and mind around what it's saying and the beauty and the glory of what is actually happening, this unpacks quite a lot of that and the benefits of it. So um, some of the benefits I wrote down were obviously we went through forgiveness and freedom from sin, new life in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, purpose, position, hope, and vision. And so I'll quickly go through them to just explore some of the points that I you know, wrote down um, in my own thoughts, but forgiveness and freedom from sin. Uh, Romans eight says we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now that's at the end of Romans eight. Um, and at the beginning of Romans eight, you also see that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So putting those two bookends together, that's crazy. We are more than conquerors, not through us, but through him mm-hmm. who loved us. Right. Yeah. Keep your train of thought. Remember the psychology gospel would stop at we are more than conquerors. That's right. We are more I, than conquerors. I'm a conqueror. And leave through Christ out of it, who is obviously the source of our overcoming. Yeah. And you see Paul, um, when, when you're reading this, you'll see a lot of like run-ons because he's he's getting all of the uh, placement right, if you will. Um, we're more than conquerors through him who loved who? Us. And he does that several times. He just goes on and on so that it's extremely clear how things work and what he's trying to say. Um, But new life in Jesus Christ, we are consistently told to put on the new self. Um, The Holy Spirit is another benefit. Gives life even though our flesh is dead. That is found 
all over the place, but Romans 8, 9 through 11. I'm going to read that real quick. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, just think about that line, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Again, that's another, another punch to the psychology gospel. It's not, it's not us giving ourselves life. It is his spirit who lives in us. That's a benefit, the Holy Spirit. Purpose, which is another benefit, is the call to be holy as God is holy and the Great Commission, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That is walking in righteousness and living in obedience. Next benefit, position. So even though we were an enemy of God, we were once an enemy of God, he sent his son to die for us and make a way for us to know him, like Matt has already uh, said many times. And through that way, God not only forgives and frees, but then also adopts us into his family, which you'll find in Romans 8 as well, as a son and daughter of God and gives us a placement, which we are all unworthy of, which is we are an heir with Christ, an heir with Christ. That's crazy. So even though we are unworthy of just forgiveness, he gives us all these benefits and puts us as an heir with Christ. It just, that's mind blowing. Next benefit is hope of what? Of heaven, eternal life, and our coming King Jesus. And then finally, vision. We no longer see the world through our fleshly eyes, but see it through spiritual eyes, which is a biblical worldview, which is what we believe in rechurched. It's so good. Ethan, you nailed it. You used scripture. You rightly divided the truth. That's what the Bible says the Christian is supposed to do, rightly dividing the word of truth. You cut it straight. That's the pure gospel. The pure gospel doesn't have any additives, any ingredients that are not in the Bible. It doesn't have any extracurricular influences. It's pure. And when it becomes contaminated, it loses its power. So the gospel and the implications therein that you receive the good news that God Again, God became man, that man became a lamb, that lamb, the lamb of God who took away the sin of the world on a cross, rose again on the third day, and he ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father. He deposited his Holy Spirit in anyone who would believe and receive that message of truth that inspires us. That is why we have an appetite to know his word. His presence lives inside of me. So his presence equals his providence. His providence means he knew the day I'd be born and he certainly knows the day I will die. And in between my birth and my death, I'm to live a life reflective, back to the light, of his glory. I'm the mirror, as you said earlier. I reflect Christ. That's what the sunlight does in relation to the moon. The moon reflects or bounces the sun's light. That's me. I'm dark unless the light of the sun reflects off of my surface. Mm. I am to be, as Paul said it, an epistle written by the ink of grace so the world can read and see that guy believes what he says he believes. And hopefully, Lord willingly, people ask, hey, what makes you so happy in a world that seems so sad? And that's just a way of me saying they're going to ask you what's why are you so different? And you're able to tell them because of Jesus. And you tell them about the good news that God saved you from the death you deserve. Now, whether or not they receive it or not, that's not up to you. There was a time in my life, Ethan, where I was so focused on whether or not somebody was going to receive the message I preached. And then I realized, who do I think I am? I'm not the Holy Spirit. And I cannot allow that pressure to be on my shoulders. I'm to live it, speak it, preach it, and leave the outcome to God. And I want to end with what Paul said in Romans chapter 1. Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why was Paul saying that? Because there were those that were, were ashamed. Their lives were on the line. People were losing their livelihoods, their lives, their family. They were being taken into custody, incarcerated because of their faith. Remember, Jesus also considered to be a renegade is why they pinned him to a cross. So now his followers are now doing the same things that he was doing, living as he was living, and there comes persecution. So Paul's like, hey, there are people that are cowering in their faith. There are people that are shuddering. There are people that are silenced. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. This is a summary statement. The just shall live by faith, justified, just if I'd never sinned in the first place because of Jesus. I am justified, just if I'd never sinned in the first place. And I live by faith in Christ alone. So that's the pure gospel. We could probably talk about this for Forever. the rest of our life. Yeah. <laughs> because that's exactly what we should be doing. We hope that you were encouraged by the Pure Gospel episode really stands in stark contrast to the previous nine episodes. The false gospel obviously comes in various forms. Got to have ears to hear and eyes to see to be able to identify and discern the lies. There are a lot of them, a lot of churches with great followings, prominent leaders and teachers are all propagating the false gospel and people are following them because they don't know the pure gospel. And the pure gospel ultimately takes over every part of your life, your mind, your heart, how you think, and it does affect how you live. And that's why what you did, Ethan, to cover the benefits of the gospel, um, the opposite of the pr prosperity gospel, right, mm. is that you don't prosper because of the gospel. It's that the gospel prospers inside of you. That's what Ethan meant when he said, we benefit because of the good news. So goodness gracious, our God is good and our God is gracious. Mm. More to say, hopefully, in the next episode. Which is season one review. Season one review. So we talked about a little bit of the false gospels in comparison to the pure gospel in this episode. But in that episode, it's going to be a sh more short form, just straight up, sticky definitions. Like, let's go over yep. all that we talked about. Yep. yep and just kind of bring it home i would love to do know? that all right hey let me say this before you close us down either guys please 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 take advantage of rechurchedpodcast.com that is our home page attached to ccoceancity.com that is our church if you are ever in the ocean city area we'd love to meet you if you already attend our church we appreciate the support and sharing and subscribing and all of those social media uh things we do but please submit a question for our Q and R episode, our question and response episode. You can find the very link to submit any question that you may have at rechurchpodcast.com or in the show notes on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Please take a moment to ask a question. We will be honored to answer it. And... This is the last week to submit a question for the Q&R episode. So make sure you submit your question no later than March 25th. And we will see you guys in the next episode. Season review. That wraps it up. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ethan Hoover. And I'm joined by Matt. Thank we'll you guys. See you guys in the next episode. God bless. Bye.